Welcome to the City Current Show. I'm your host, Andrew Bartolotta. We are always honored to bring you stories of individuals and organizations with inspiring stories working to make an impact in our community and beyond, powering the good and even around the globe. And today we have lead strategist and happiness coach, Steve Fredlin, who will discuss how we can become a happier leader. Steve, thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to be here, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So before we talk about happiness, give listeners an idea for your career and humanitarian work, both in rural East Central Minnesota and Rwanda. I'm about 52 years old, so I've been in the workforce about 30 years. Uh, the first 25 years was really in corporate America. So most of that was uh, as an actuary, financial services, uh, that kind of stuff. But then about 20 years of that, I did nonprofit stuff on the side as well. So the leadership kind of spanned both. And so that includes my work in Rwanda, which I'm sure that we'll get into. Um, then about three years ago or so, I decided to go out on my own and start something called Small Small Business. Uh, and really the goal is to, how can we help our communities become more vibrant? How can we, you know, I was just getting so tired of seeing, you know, store after store being closed up. And this is even pre-pandemic. And I thought, how can I be part of the solution? So I actually left the corporate world to say, how can I bring the support uh, to these small businesses, these small nonprofits, uh, to help them, uh, you know, survive and thrive. Um, and, and because I think ultimately they are the lifeblood of our communities. And so that is my journey. So the analytical side, corporate side, nonprofit overlap, and then now uh, as an entrepreneur and, and a speaker. Now, was there humanitarian work more in the skilled volunteer side with your leadership training? Was it more getting hands dirty and helping with specific items needed in Rwanda? So it started with uh, just having an, a personal passion for the AIDS crisis in sub-Saharan Africa. And just like, how can I get involved with this? And, you know, each year I would give some money, but I just couldn't, I wanted to get more and more involved. And at the same time, I was struggling with how can I unite the people of East Central Minnesota, which is where I live. And I just have such a passion for unity and trying to break through divisive things. And, and so I had these two things going on at, at the same time. And I'm sort of a serial problem solver. And I'm trying to figure out like, how can I solve this problem? And I ended up creating something called Our Response, which is really about uniting East Central Minnesota to respond to global poverty, disease, and suffering. And so on one side of it, it was really about how do we unite people here? How do we get them to overcome their political and religious and every other sort of divide that there is, and then to have impact over there? And so ultimately, when it comes to what we did over there, we ended up being a fundraising arm to a large degree for an organization that had the boots on the ground over there, uh, because our model is really about community transformation over in Rwanda. The idea was to not just give them, you know, here's some water, here's some food, here's some, some things. The idea was actually to transform a community so that they would become more self-sustainable. And so there were people over there on the ground day after day helping those folks build those, that infrastructure that they needed, whether that was financial or uh, female empowerment or business or whatever that is. And then we would actually raise money in East Central Minnesota by uniting people with concerts and all kinds of activities. The money would go over there. And then I brought four groups of people over there to actually see firsthand what was going on over there. And one of the things that we really struggled with personally was because we weren't really getting our hands dirty. We weren't building the house. We weren't building the school. We weren't doing those things. And that was intentional. We all wanted to. But the idea was that this needed to, to belong to the residents. This needed to be their thing. Rather than Westerners coming in to put in a well, we needed to have them really own that well, to really own that school, to have sweat equity and all of those things. And so the model was go over there, build relationships, encourage the heck out of them, and bring back the stories uh, that could then uh, cre create more financial uh, investment as well as more unity. I really love the way that you are helping um, those in Minnesota realize what's going on in Rwanda and, and bridging that gap. So switching gears to happiness, your tagline is don't lead like you're choosing toothpaste. What does that mean? And give listeners an idea for your own personal journey to finding happiness. Yeah, so it, it really does start with my personal journey. That's really it. But but don't lead like you're choosing toothpaste is, is really a, an indictment of how often we make decisions by default right? We, we tend to just do things because it's the way they've always been done or because that's the way that we should do things or that this is what people expect of us. And so we don't really intentionally make decisions that are, that are in alignment with who we really are. We just sort of follow the defaults. And then one day we wake up and we realize we're miserable. Even if our life is really good, we're kind of miserable. And I would argue that a lot of that is that 
accumulated effect of making decisions that aren't intentionally aligned with who we are. And so the, the don't lead by like you're choosing toothpaste is, is a statement about that because, you know, I asked the audience, you know, who here actually sat down and decided what kind of toothpaste you're going to use? I mean, did you, you know, did you do the studies and see which is most effective? Did you do a taste test with Crest and Colgate and AIM and Pepsodent and Sensodyne and figure out like, oh man, I like this. And there's sort of this, you know, this trade-off between effectiveness and taste. And, you know, we're really being intentional about what toothpaste, no. I mean, most of us, uh, I have encountered a few people that said I did that because that was my job, but, but most of us, you know, it's what we grew up. We grew up using Crest or we, we got into a relationship and our partner used AIM and we just kind of, that's how we, that's how we make decisions, right? Uh, just that's the default. That's kind of what we've always used. And I think that's how we end up making decisions as leaders. Well, that's, you know, that's how Billy did it. That's how Sally did it. I'm just going to do it that way. And we think, we think it's less, you know, less risky because I think what happens in those cases is that then if things go wrong, we can blame Billy or Sally because, well, they're the ones that did it before. And I just did what they always did. It feels less risky, but then what happens is it's risky personally because ultimately we end up making decisions that aren't aligned with who we are. So we do things the way that Billy and Sally always did them, and it's not really who we are. And we end up hating our job, we hating our leaders, we hate our leadership. Um, and so that's really what that's all about. And so my own personal journey really started uh, about 15 years ago when. Man, I, things were, I was crushing things, right? I was in the corporate world, Fortune 500 company. I just got a big promotion, great relationship with my wife. I had three kids, great relationship with them. Everything was perfect on paper. But I found myself every afternoon walking across the Stone Arch Bridge in Minneapolis, trying to figure out why I was so miserable. It didn't make any sense to me. I'm very logical, right? I'm, a, I'm an actuary. I'm very yeah. logical. And <laughs> like, this doesn't make any sense. What, what is wrong with me? Why am I not happy? when on paper, my life is so good. And it's like, somebody forgot to tell my heart that my paper life was so good. And I felt trapped. I felt trapped in this good life. I felt like I didn't have the right to complain because I didn't like my life was perfect. And now I, you know, been exposed to life in Rwanda and I'm like, how can I be miserable with this life? And so that started me on this journey of trying to realize, figure out like, what is actually going on here? What's the crux of this? And I don't want to, you know, there's, there's some chemical things that people have and there's depression is real and all of that stuff. And I was trying to figure out like, what's going on in my world. And as I've explored this, as I've talked to a bunch of people, it really resonates with them. Like a lot of this is because of our misalignment. Uh, our life really isn't lined up with who we are at our core. And for me, long story shorter a little bit, is that that big promotion I'd gotten had pulled me away from my core strengths. Like I was an actuary, I'm a problem solver, clean sheet of paper, let's go, let's figure this out. And I got promoted, a great job, great bonus, whatever, to leading this big marketing product development area. And I hated it because it wasn't lined up with who I was. It demanded different skills and it had nothing to do with the people, the team. It was just not lined up. And so that's when I started realizing there's something to this um, being lined up with who we really are that, Im that impacts our happiness even more than our success. So what would you say is the backbone of happiness? Yeah, so that's a great, that's a great segue. So I refer to the backbone of happiness in my talk because it's like, like our physical backbone is like our support structure for our body, right? And when things are lined up there, life is just kind of good. We, we move freer, all of those things. When our back is kind of misaligned, we start feeling, you know, sort of uncomfortable, then there's some pain, we start to lose sleep, we get irritable, all of those things. And the same thing that happens with our backbone of happiness, which is really our core identity, which is who we are, what we want, where we want to go, how do we want to get there, who do we want to get there with, all of these things, which are core, essential parts of who we are, when those things are lined up with our actual reality, man, life is good, right? When we are with the people we want to be with, we're doing the things we want to do, and we're in alignment with our values and our personality, life is so good. But when there's that misalignment, when our back starts getting out of whack a little bit, that's when we start to feel unhappy uh, and all those other symptoms of irritability and stress and headaches and all of those things. I think that's a great way of how our wovenness of happiness can can come into play when it comes to all these different factors. So what would you say, what do you mean when you talk about default driven leadership? Yeah, it's, it's kind of what we talked about a little bit before where we just make decisions by default. We're not actually thinking what, what does this look like for me? I think, I think a lot of times, especially people that move into leadership roles for the first time, they just think they're supposed to do it the way it's always been done. And the reality is that if you were chosen as a leader, Typically, it's because of the way that you think, the way that you act, the way that you do things. But I think we're kind of timid 
to actually take leadership. And it doesn't mean you have to be arrogant and all powerful, but I think we're sort of timid. And so we do things the default way. We do things the way that they've always been done. Um, either, you know, I, I talk about just having casual, we make casual decisions. And one of the most casual decisions we make is just doing things by default, the way they've always been done. We also do things a lot because we should do those things. And I say, you know, we get should on a lot. And I said, <laughs> so don't worry. But like, we, we do that. Either we do that to ourselves, or we allow ourselves to do that. Like, well, I should go to this conference. I should hire that person. I, I should go on this podcast. I should, 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 should. And we do that. Or it's, it's what other people expect of us. Well, they're expecting me to go to college. They're expecting me to get married. They're expecting me. And so we heap on all of this stuff. And I think all of those are sort of a form of default driven where it's not really truly uh, in alignment with who we are. And so we lead by default and that ends up getting us in, get a, getting us in trouble emotionally because we end up hating our job, hating our leadership, hating our staff. And we don't really understand why. And a lot of it's because of uh, how we make decisions. Thanks for diving in more about that, because I think a lot of us, just like you said, it's our default. And so we don't even think about it for the most part, but being able to sit back and say, oh, maybe I'm tired of getting shit on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're able to, to move from that. Talk a little bit more about small, small business. You mentioned it earlier. How does it provide entrepreneurs, small business owners, and nonprofit leaders with a level of this support that usually you can only find in larger organizations? Yeah, and that's really the whole mission of this thing is one of, one of the things I found when I started digging into this, when I, you know, I left the corporate world, said, how can I help our communities become more vibrant? Uh, surrounded myself with the right people said, what's my role in this thing? And they're like, man, our small businesses, our small nonprofits, these mom and pop shops are closing up left and right. They need your experience and your expertise to help them, help them grow and help them sustain and that sort of thing, whether that's getting online, whatever that is. And so I sort of made that my mandate to serve those folks. Now, small, small business does have some bigger clients, but our focus really and our priority is on, is on those people. And so the way we do that is really step one, get clarity. It's just like this happiness thing. You need to be clear on who you are before you can make decisions that are aligned with that. And in small business, you need to be clear on what's going on in your business. What do you actually want? What's your vision? What's your goals? And what's actually the problem going on? I think a lot of small businesses don't really even know that or nonprofits, they don't really know that. I asked them, you know, so why did you get in? Why did you start this business? I'm like, it seems like a pretty obvious question. A lot of times it's like either, well, my, my parents had a business, so I thought that'd be a good way to go. Or, you know, I always, I roofed houses and I hated my boss, so I started my own business. Well, those could be okay, but those aren't necessarily going to help you be successful as a small business owner. And so part of it's just clarifying, why are you actually doing this? What are your goals? Is your goal financial freedom? Is your goal to be able to solve bigger problems? Is your goal to leave a legacy? Are you trying to leave an asset for your kids? Are you trying to you know, increase your influence in the community? Like, what are you, what are you really trying to do with this thing? Uh, and so that's one of the things that we bring that a lot of folks don't get that level of service because for the small, small business, they, they're not going to pay. They either can't afford or they don't see the value in paying for an outside coach or consultant. Because I get that. People say, well, you can't help me with my roofing business because you've never roofed a house. They don't understand that, the, that I can still help them because I understand right. the business principles of, of things. So they don't hire those folks. So then they end up, if they get support, it's sort of this, they're watching YouTube where they're getting free support from the community. Now, these are good hearted people that are offering this free small business support, but they really don't have the level of experience, level of expertise that can honestly help them get to the next level. And so what I'm trying to do with small, small business is work with me, get clear on what we're trying to do. Let's get a strategy. Let's get a roadmap going forward. And then I have a network of experts from around the world, frankly, that will help in those situations that are willing to help small businesses at a price they can afford. Uh, or we work with like, we have state programs that we're partnered with. So we can actually get state funding to actually get these small businesses and nonprofits, the level of support that, that they otherwise wouldn't get from world-class experts, frankly, people that are, you know, MBAs and PhDs and have owned businesses for 40 years and, and all of these things. So that's, that's sort of the problem I'm trying to solve is how do we get the right level of support to those folks that really need it the most that otherwise aren't going to be able to afford it. And then you're allowing them to, to help them work on their business instead of just in their business day yep. to day, not being able to really see the bigger picture. Steve, where can people go to learn more about you, your training, small, small business, and more? Yeah. So a couple of websites, smallsmallbusiness.com. 
And people go, like, is that intentional? Small, small, yeah, that's absolutely intentional because our focus is not just on small business because you could have $10 million a year in revenue and be considered a small business. Our focus is small, small business. So ssb.com, small, small business.com. And then stevefredland.com, just my name, uh, is where you can find out more about my speaking exploits. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure.